We are going to go to Acts chapter 10. We're going to continue in the series. And you would think that the encounter with Peter and Cornelius, uh, it's a very long narrative. There's 48 verses. But we're going to do things a little differently tonight in that we are going to step back and look at the bigger picture. In order to do that, we're going to have to read all 48 verses so we can see the beginning, the middle, and the end. And when you read the full picture here, you see the big picture, but then you see how God is moving in this right here, this account. And when we step back and look at that, and you say, you know what, this is once again another way which God is providentially doing all of His will and using people. And just He's so into the details. And it's, it's overwhelmingly peaceful, and uh, I pray that you have the same blessing. The name of the message is Faith in the Providence I'm Experiencing. Faith in the Providence that I'm Experiencing. Now, next week, or maybe when the Lord leads again, we will go verse by verse in an exegetical way that we're used to doing. But here we're just going to look at how God is in providence. In these 48 verses, we're going to look at the providence of God. There's going to be two things, as I read, that I want you to pay attention to. God's preparation and the execution of Cornelius hearing the gospel and Peter delivering the gospel. And the next thing that I want you to see as we read are the dramatic changes in both men's lives. The dramatic change in Peter's life and the dramatic change in Cornelius' life. You could say almost that there were two conversions. We know that Cornelius was converted uh, spiritually unto salvation, but here Peter is converted of heart of his outlook. And we see how God prepares him to do that. Now, we're going to read again, starting in verse 1 of chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake with unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he came very hungry. And would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and let down to earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed thou call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now when Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent to him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am 
he whom ye seek? What is the cause whereof ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house, and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in, and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto them without gainsaying. As soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore the Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done thou, that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God? Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that, though, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive a remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Lord, we come again we bow before your throne of grace thanking you, Lord, for your rich blessings, your goodness to us, your sovereign grace, the peace you give us in our hearts, even in our darkest days, Father, you, you warm us with your light and your love is shed abroad in our hearts. Father, and we thank you, Lord, for the salvation which you give. We pray that you please be with your word tonight and help hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So now that we have the big picture, and it's like, again, it's a very long narrative, one of the things that we want to think about is God was going to do something in Peter's life that Peter had never experienced before. This wasn't something, I mean, this was very new to Peter. That God was going to prepare Peter, and he prepared Peter with this vision of what God is about to do. And so, in a special way, he sat Peter and he got him and and we see that he had this vision. 
Now, when we read this, we can see providence, can't we? We can see the providence of God moving in and out of the lives of those whom, and those in His will and His purpose. And the, the providence which we see is a preparation of Cornelius in verse 1 through 8, the preparation of Peter in verse 9 through 20, and the lessons which they experienced are brought to light. They're made plain at the end of the chapter. As we see Peter says, as I perceive, this is what God is doing. First of all, we need to understand God's providence is with people and to people. He uses us. He uses people. He uses people in your lives to accomplish your plan and to accomplish His plan. The thing that we can see about Cornelius is that salvation does not start with man. Salvation starts with God. Blessings start with God. It is All our good gifts are from God. The encouragement we need. He knows what we need before we even need it. All of these are from God. God, had, God providentially led you to salvation. If you look back on your life and you remember when you were saved, it wasn't by a mountain talking to you or a cloud or it was somebody, it was a person, wasn't it, who had brought the Word of God to you. And that's the same thing we see that God is doing here and God is doing today. You never know. You never know when the Lord's going to use you and to, to bring you to one of His lost sheep, to bring the Gospel to them. And so we see that God always starts with salvation. God always starts salvation. God is the one who seeks. He saves, he finds, and then he keeps. God is the one who seeks, he finds, he saves, and keeps. But he, he knows exactly where everyone... He doesn't have to seek very far, does he? He knows exactly where they are. But um, we are going to go through here, but in verse 1 it says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. One of the things we need to immediately observe about Cornelius is he's a Gentile. He's a Roman Gentile. And he was a leader uh, of a, now this band. Now, a legion is a thousand Roman soldiers. And a band is 600. Okay? And then a centurion was in charge of a hundred of the Roman soldiers. So Cornelius was in charge of of one of these 100, and it says that he was a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day. So let's keep in mind the times here, because we're going to see something about God's providence. God has perfect timing. His time's always perfect. So let's keep this in mind. At, at 3 p.m., around 3 p.m. on a day, Cornelius sees this vision. And it says, It was the angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter, he lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Now notice, the angel was not sent to minister the word to Cornelius. The angel didn't lead Cornelius to the, the Lord. He said, go and find a man who will lead you to the Lord. And here again, we, we know that angels are ministering spirits, but they do not give the gospel. God uses men and women to spread the gospel. He doesn't use His angels. It's, it's not the angels, but men that are employed to minister the Word of God. Um, if you look at the, the eunuch, was ministered by Philip. Saul of Tarsus was ministered to by Anias or Annas, the prophets of old, God used men to talk to his people and to instruct them. 
But in verse 7, what did he do? And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when, they, when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. In verse 33, when he's recalling the story to Peter, he tells Peter, I immediately sent men. When the angel said, hey, send somebody, we see that it's okay, well, you know, if I get around that, if I get around to it tomorrow or I can do it another time. I don't know if you all have had this experience when the Spirit talks to you. It's usually with haste. Do something with haste. And um, uh, I often give that, that, that time that I was, I know I've told this story before, but when I was at camp, the one of the few times I was at camp, I got heat exhaustion, and I'll, I'll make it quick. I got heat exhaustion, and uh, went to the Monticello Hospital, waited there forever, and then went to Somerset Hospital, waited there forever, and then finally, just they prescribed me water. <laughs> I was dehydrated and everything. I had a heat stroke or something, so I came home, and I finally got into my air-conditioned bed. April went back to camp, and I was like, finally. This is what I want right here. This, you know, just to eat salt the, from popcorn. You know, it's, it was a horrible recovery. Drink water and popcorn and, and whatever. And God smacked me right in the heart. And he placed on my heart baptism. Baptism. And then he placed on my heart a person to talk to about baptism. And I was like, that's strange. Okay, I'll shake that off. No, it didn't go away. I could not shake it. And he would not let up. He would not let up in my heart. You need to go back <laughs> to the heat zone. You need to go back to camp. You need to get out of this air-conditioned bed, and you need to go back, get your clothes on. You're, you're okay. Go and talk to this certain person about camp. I was like, okay. I, I know I'm not going to get relief until I do that. And so I got up, I drove, and, every, and April was definitely shocked to see me. Uh, and then I went to this person. And I didn't say a word. And it was, it was a teenager. It was a teenage boy. And I didn't say a word to him. And he said, Brother Philip, I wanted to talk to you about scriptural baptism. And, you know, that taught me a couple things. I mean, I was like, duh, duh, oh, okay. I, I was stuttering. I was like, I, I will if I could talk. You know, I felt weak in the knees. And I was like, the Lord not only prepared me what to talk about, He prepared Him what to be talked to about. And we were miles and miles apart. And in the weirdest of circumstances, I just came back home from all night in the ER. And now I'm going back. And, you know, I just felt the presence of the Lord. And, but he pressed that upon me. Make haste. Now, you, you all may... Now, that doesn't happen to me every day. And you all may or may not have an experience like that, but you should have experience in prayer. If you're quiet long enough in prayer, the Lord may press on your heart to pray for someone or make a dish for someone or call someone. And... Just, you have a willing and able and ready heart to serve God, love God's people. God's going to press on your heart how to help them. What's the best way to do to, to help them? And so we see that Cornelius is like, you need to go. And it's a good thing Cornelius did because God's timing is perfect. Because just as Peter goes up on the roof, at noon the next day, Joppa is 30 minutes from Caesarea. This is not Caesarea Philippi. Uh, this is a different Caesarea up in like the Samaria region. It's about 30 miles north of Joppa where Peter was, which is called a day's journey. And so it took them about a day to get there, and they get there right as Peter is having this vision at noon the next day, on verse 9, on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up into the housetop to pray. 
about the sixth hour, that's noon. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and then we know that he saw the heaven open, and God had deployed the sheet with the unclean beasts and the, the crawling things and the creeping things. In verse 13, he says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Peter's like, is this a test? I mean, think about this. Peter's reply is, you know, it, it, it's a reaction. It's, it's, it's like a reflex. The Jews were not, they had dietary restriction in Leviticus 11. They've always had these dietary. These are considered unclean to the Jews. And verse 15, And the voice spake unto him again the second time. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Three times. In verse 16, this was done thrice. There's always three things happen to Peter, isn't there? There's the, the, the cock crow, three times. He denied the Lord, three times. And Jesus asked him, Dost thou love me? Three times. And here, um, we're not told, but we're wondering if it took three times for Peter to, to submit. And, so, and But what did Peter do? He was confused. Verse 17, Now while Peter doubted, in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. This is new, Lord. This isn't my normal trial. And many times, there will be times in our lives where the one thing that you can see here is that both Cornelius and Peter weren't given the bigger picture. They weren't told why. Cornelius wasn't told why to send men to Peter. He just, he'll tell you what to do. And Peter wasn't told why God wants me to rise, kill, and eat. And now he's calling the things that have always been my whole life uncommon, he's calling them clean. So what did Peter do? He doubted in himself. He thought about it. I wonder how long he thought about this. Because in verse 19... It says he was thinking on the vision. He was continually thinking about the vision. The only info they had is a command of faith to obey. They didn't have the big picture. All they had was believe the Lord and obey the Lord. And here he says in uh, verse 17, now when Peter doubted in himself, what this vision should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Peter, or I'm sorry, whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. And verse 19, when Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit had said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now, we know God's providence when we're experiencing the providence of God. Many times it can be confusing. I don't understand what's happening. I don't know why this is happening. God is throwing something at me new to believe, to trust in Him in a totally different way. This isn't my normal financial issue. This isn't my normal pray for my kids issue. This isn't my normal issues. This is different. This is different. Many times you will have events in your life where you may be confused by what's going on. What's the purpose behind this, Lord? And, but we need to understand we're never told to understand. We're just told to believe. Eventually, Peter and Cornelius, the truth comes to light. But right now, they're in the middle of this lesson. They, they don't have the answer to the lesson, but they're in the lesson now. And in the events which God puts in our lives, it could be confusing, it, it, but we're experiencing the lesson. We're going to get taught the lesson at the end of it. 
So let's just believe God and say, Lord, I know what you're doing. You're in control. I mean, not only does God know the bigger picture, it's Him who designed it. God has a bigger picture. I just need to believe in His bigger picture. And He... And there's nothing that he will do that he will not do well. Um, we see the same exact thing prior, didn't we? There's a couple, a couple chapters back um, when Annas had to go to Paul. And <laughs> Annas was like, Lord, uh, you want me to go to the Saul of Tarsus? And it, what's interesting about that, I, I wish we had more time to, to go there. Well, it's not, it's not too far away, is it? Here, chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath, chapter 9, verse 13, hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And there he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. <laughs> It's almost like, do you think Ananias would have changed God's mind? Oh, that's right, Ananias. I forgot. That you're right. I don't. Uh, you know what? Don't go. Don't. Don't. And sometimes we question, as if you know. And I, I know that it was scary and it was confusing to Ananias. He says, "Go thy way. Do what I told you to do. And don't worry about it." Do what I told you to do. Don't worry about it. Same thing with Philip and Ethiopian eunuch. He, revival broke out in Samaria. And God is like, and the angel came and God said, hey, leave here and go and travel on the desert road. Leave this, this awesome time that you're having of revival and, and go the desert road. And you know that that would have been, it doesn't say that Philip talked back to or anything, but I wonder, that long journey from Samaria to I mean, he passed Jerusalem. He passed his house. Don't you hate to pass your house going somewhere? He passed his house and then took a, and took a right and went towards the sea. And that whole time, what are we supposed to do when God's providence? We're in this lesson and it's confusing. We believe and we obey. And when God gives us haste, we do it immediately. We do it immediately. Because God's timing is perfect. I want to say this, and here's a beautiful thought I, I want you all to walk home with. Peter did get the final lesson, and he, we read, as we read, that he had perceived that God is not a respecter of persons. When he was in Cornelius' house and he started preaching, and then the Holy Spirit came, which... We're not gonna. We're going to be in this chapter again. We're going to, because this is a big deal. What's going on here? The Holy Spirit going to the Gentiles. Salvation is going to the Gentiles. We'll, we'll we'll talk about that next time. But when you look back and you take the bigger view of this, the Lord wasn't just changing Peter's diet. He was changing Peter's heart. He was changing Peter's outlook. This confusing event of, I don't understand this, and he's meditating on it, and he's wondering what's going on. This whole time, he's changing Peter's outlook on life. And there's many things God may put into your life that's brand new. It's going to shake your world. It's going to change your perspective of life. God is going to loosen your anchors a little bit more to this earth. And that we see that. Um, sometimes God puts these events in our lives and our main objectives change, don't they? It used to be my main objective in life, my ultimate goal was to retire. That's it. I'm going to retire. That's my biggest goal. And then my main objective, well, do you know what? My main objective is to, to have a family or to be a good husband. And all those things are good. To be a good father. That was my main objective. And then we see that 
the goals in life. I, uh, I know she's listening and, and continue to listen or pray for Sister Jamie. She blessed me so much in the hospital. I went to be an encouragement to her and I walked away encouraged and I was watching her deal with a perspective. Her learning a perspective of it's not about this life. It's not, I'm in God's hands and I'm just an instrument in God's hands. It's not about retirement. It's not about a house. It's not about clothes. It's not about this or this or this. It's about God. And however God has me here in this orchestra of my life, I want you to picture that you're just one member in God's orchestra. And we want to play our note and play our note and play our note, but God's like, no, it's not time for you to play your note. And... He'll want me to play my note here and there, but it's going to contribute to the whole sound. And He is the master composer of all of it. And I'm playing my sound. And you know, when it is time for me to stop playing, then I retire. And then the Lord takes me home. When I retire, the Lord takes me home. The Lord has me here still to be a blessing, to be a testimony. You know, I told, I told Jamie, I said, you know, it was so good seeing you Sunday. It was so sweet. And you're such a testimony. You don't have to even talk to be a testimony because people see what you went through to be here. And if it didn't bring conviction to those who can't come because of far less, then it brought an encouragement to see the grace of God lift her up and bring her to the place that she wanted to be the most on earth. The place that she wanted to be the most on earth is right here. Perspective. God will put an event in your life. It may be confusing, but you know, as I, I was watching her, she's having an experience that I may never have. She may, she may be having a closeness that I may never I may never experience that close that closeness, and I don't keep mean to keep bringing her up. I know I'm embarrassing her, and I don't want to do that. But it got. Then I started looking at this, and look at Peter through this. Lord, what does this mean? And so, rather than just fixating on what it meant, he trusted God, and he did what God told him to do. And then later, ah. That's why God did that. And he was never going to find that out until he believed and obeyed. And so many times so we see that the lesson that they were living was finally brought to light at the end. Because Peter himself even discussed with Cornelius. Oh, and we see the both. We see God bring them both together. They both had confusion. <laughs> uh, Cornelius is like, okay, I don't, I don't know why. You just came out of me out of the blue and want me to sin. And then we see the same, you know, but he brings it up together at the end. The thing that we need to remember is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways and He will direct your path. And that that simple sermon or that simple message or <laughs> that simple verse I learned as a child is just as profound every day, isn't it? Do you have the faith in the providence of God? Do you have faith in the the providence that you're experiencing? I told Sister Jennifer on the phone the other night, and she's talking about people who, that she's interacting with uh, there at the VA and here and there. And I said, S Sister Jennifer, you're in a place that uh, the Lord really used you to just speak to someone. And what you're going through, if they saw the peace of God that's in your heart, the grace that's in your heart, that's not normal. That's, that's God. And when you say, you know what, God has gotten me through, she, she was lifting my heart. 
by going, I mean, it's been a year, hasn't it, sister? It's been a year. But the Lord has blessed her. And all we can do is not try to understand it, but lean on Him. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Lean on Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. He is the Master. You know, it may be confusing to you what you're going through, but we're never told to trust and understand, trust and obey. God will work it out. God's already got it worked out. And I don't know why, Lord, you're doing this. Hopefully one day you'll let me know. But I want to be pleasing to you and trust you. And trust you. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this lesson. Thank you, Lord, and we pray that you use it in hearts, in minds, in people's lives. Father, we pray for Sister Jennifer. Lift her up, Lord, and and give her the the courage, the comfort, the encouragement. And Father, we know that that to be absent from our body is to be present with you. Father, we know that Brother Marshall are seeing seeing sights that, that would never even enter our mind. But we know one day, Father, we'll all be in heaven. What a day that'll be. We all see our Savior. And we'll all shout victory. Father, just it's a, just not our time right now, but you have the time. And Father, we, when our time comes, we'll trust in you. Oh, just what a blessing, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement of the heart. We pray for each one here. We pray for those who are in pain and sickness that you'll help their suffering. It be thy will, Father, we know that you can and will give you all the praise and all the glory when you lift them up. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand and have just...